Thank you so much for joining. Uh, I am Steve Mantle with Innovate Ag. We'll get kicked off in just a moment as everyone's landing into the Zoom portal. We're excited to talk today about the Swiss Army knife of digitizing crop loads with Enza, Green Atlas, and Fruition. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So, uh, hi, Steve Mantle, founder and CEO of Innovate Ag. We're out of Washington State. And what we're going to talk about today is how growers are using data uh, across the globe to make critical decisions in their crop load, uh, resulting in better profits, uh, better uh, quality, and hopefully happier farmers. So let's jump in. So um, there's myself, we'll have um, Steve Shedding will speak in a moment, one of the co-founders of Green Atlas. Danny Valdivinos is joining us in from Yakima, Washington today, um, from the North America division of TNG Enza. And then the Motley crew here down in New Zealand, Mike, Jack, and Alex with Fruition. And Fruition is a partners with Green Atlas as well. And as you'll see in the latter half, half of this presentation, very focused on bringing together their horticulture expertise and combining that with data um, to enable growers with quantifiable results. So we'll go on to the next slide. So we're really all aligned around challenges that growers are facing. I'll need to increase yields where you ultimately want a better grade of crop along with uh, a better volume and frankly, more consistency in the volume. And across uh, your blocks, there's a high degree of variability. And that yield gap is what we're all chasing off after between uh, the high and the low performing blocks of crops. And little mother nature keeps getting in the darn way along the way. And so ultimately the focus is on equipping with the tools and data to, to navigate all these moving parts. Let's go to the next slide. So our promise as Innovate is to provide assistance to the management side on, on forecasting, the grower on making more uh, better on farm decisions uh, or data informed decisions, and then uh, even informing on the sales desk on um, better predictions so that you can um, negotiate with higher confidence when it comes to working with your retailers. And so focus for us is first yield estimation, and then second field optimization. And the universal language here across all of this is data, of course, um, across block to block and, and year to year. So um, we believe that it's not just about, if we can go to the next slide, um, your yield piece, but also looking at what's going on in other parts of your orchard. And so streamlining those around, uh, taking data silos around so nutrient availability and texture and pH, organic matter is really key. That's really out of scope for today, but that's part of layering in the different uh, levels of data. And cutting edge proven technology we found is Green Atlas as the leader when it comes to mapping with a high degree of confidence, your variability, whether it is at bud stage, which you'll hear fruition talk about today, to uh, to blossom, to pre and post thin, and uh, all the way up until harvest. And then even in the off season, when you're looking at canopy to look at decisions when it comes to pruning. Just go to the next slide. You know, driving uh, these estimations in a way that's consumable to growers is really key. You can see the, the native green atlas tool that we provide to growers. Um, we also can provide the data feed in a way that you can ingest into your own database or data warehouse. In some cases, growers aren't quite ready for that, but that is our focus on enabling you to, when you are ready, 
have access to your data in your own tools. And then um, we're, you'll see a couple of examples that Danny will show um, where we're showing it in other tool sets, whether it be PDFs, and we're working with Harvest Engine um, to make it available on iOS and Android devices as well. Let's take a peek at the next slide. So predicting yield with precision is really the name of the game. Um, this is an example of a block where you can see uh, really where your averages in yellow range from 19 apples uh, per tree to 34 apples per tree, uh, rough year in this particular uh, block, and how that changes over time. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, really focusing in what does that distribution look like? What are you peaking at in terms of your number of apples per box? In this case, you can see uh, it's at right in 80, 88. Um, and working to predict that further and further out is the name of the game here as well. We'll go to the next slide. Providing those actionable insights all year long, again, to field operations on pruning, bud, blossom, thinning, harvest, as well as to uh, the various other stakeholders that you have on the management side of things. I'll pass off to Steve Shedding to speak as to some of the work that they've done on um, their data being peer reviewed. Yeah, um, so thanks for that, Steve. Um, thanks for the for the intro. Um, so just, a, I guess, a bit of history that leads into this. Um, you know, Green Atlas has, you know, very firm roots in a science and, and research background. All of us that are engineers with Green Atlas have that as our background, having been various flavors of academic over the years, as well as, uh, you know, in some cases, serial entrepreneurs and, uh, you know, working for big corporates. So there's a, there's a real breadth of experience, but the foundation is the science. And so leading into Green Atlas being established, um, you know, there was almost a decade of R&D out of the University of Sydney. Um, and that R&D was largely funded through grower levies in Australia. So typically it would be peak industry bodies, apples and pears Australia, horticulture innovation. So these bodies would be saying, or asking growers, what are, what are your key problems? And, and then they would ask the universities, so people like James Underwood, my co-founder, you know, how do we solve these problems using cutting edge technologies from robotics and, and computer vision? And so, you know, that decade of work really established, you know, the ground rules of, you know, how do you use those technologies? Um, it established, how do we validate these kind of technologies and that's something we find or we we believe is incredibly important is the validation we want growers to believe that they're going to get typical results and we only want to report typical results um, and even better than that is if a third party has independently validated um, what we are saying um, and so with that in mind having had that long history uh, we work with a lot of uh, different people to do that validation. Uh, a key one is Agriculture Victoria in Australia, who, uh, as you can see on this slide, have published quite a few papers on, you know, is the cartographer actually an instrument that you could use in an orchard? So really looking into all of our different measures, whether they're, um, you know, measuring fruit or buds or flowers uh, through to the geometric measures that we have, really getting to the brass tacks of, you know, when the cartographer reports these things, is that quantity really there in the orchard? Um, and as you can see here, a number of papers that say, yes, they really are there and they report typical results, right? And so we don't, we don't shy away from reporting those typical results. In fact, we think it's probably the best advertising we could ever have. Um, but along with that, we also work with our partners, so people like Innovate and Fruition that are on this call, and we are constantly validating our results. Almost every block we ever scan, we do some measure of, um, of ground truthing so that there is always some validation and some confidence in the, in the results that we, we report. Um, and really the reason for all of that is precision um, is a super, super important. And if you don't have precision, you can't have accuracy. 
And certainly when you get towards the end of the season and you're looking at yield estimates, you know, accuracy is absolutely the key. So all of this is to say is as a company, we have this scientific grounding, but really we want to be transparent, right? And that's, that we think is is really what it's all about is we we really want to be transparent in when we report a result it's a real result thank you steve and that's what we've seen over and over again with um with the results that we've delivered in this hemisphere and as you'll see um with the fruition gents here uh in the southern hemisphere is uh we come back generally with single digit accuracy um consistently so if we go to the next slide um we'll jump in 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 uh once with the fruition gentlemen we'll talk about uh enabling spray applications and some of the work there we really believe for for innovate this is the year of pushing on the breakthrough up here in the northern hemisphere on enabling spray applications we're going to double down our intent is to double down on that in the smart orchard project and again with the the goal to uh optimize your your precision crop load let's go to the next slide so i'll hand it off to danny and again danny thank you so much for joining us today and if you could share some of your experiences and a background on anza that'd be great yeah well uh thanks for that steve and uh you can go ahead and and click to the next page first of all you know thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit of, about our experience here in North America as you know we're testing the water with this new technology and it seems to be pretty exciting and it seems to show a lot of potential for the data that you know we've been craving over the years to have uh, from a fruit quality perspective marketing and sales perspective even efficiencies on the packing line so it's pretty exciting to be on the front end of this type of technology but uh, first of all those who don't know me my name is uh, Danny Valdivinos um, I'm the operations manager for Enza Fruit Products here in North America, and uh, Enza Fruit Products is a subsidiary of TNG Global. I've been working for Enza now. Well, next month will be seven years, uh, different in different roles. First as quality control and packing manager, so mostly on the post harvest side of things, and now as operations manager with a bit of horticulture included. Um, you know, thinking back of my experience with Enza, it actually goes back even further where I was uh, uh, indirectly direct and directly involved since 2011 through my previous employer at Allen Brothers. They were the first uh, uh, packing operations uh, to pack the Envy variety, and I happened to be there on, on the packing line when, when it was being packed. So I've been watching this, that MV specifically grow over the years now, and uh, been pretty proud to be part of that growth. Standing since 1948, oh, excuse me, standing since 1948, uh, the company is known for exports of high quality apples world, worldwide. And since 1991, under the name of Enza, uh, that's how it's been known. In 2002, TNG acquired Enza, and TNG is a large packer, grower, shipper from New Zealand, one of the largest. Um, TNG has been in business for 124 years this year, and we have people in over 60 countries and apple production of our premium delicious apple varieties in over 10 countries. Enza and TNG have been leaders in managed varieties since the early 90s, specifically with Jazz and Envy, and the earliest variety that we had was Pacific Rose. Next. So, you know, when dealing with uh, premium Apple brands or, or products, um, whether it's in manufacturing or in tree fruit, um, what's most important is consistency. Um, that consistency um, has allowed us to build our, our, our brands, gain trust from our customers that ultimately bring stronger profits to our growers and all stakeholders involved. Yeah, as you just specified, Steve, the biggest challenges in our orchards are, are trying to understand the uniformity and then being able to go to the areas where we're having the issues 
or the variability and, and being able to do something about it. Um, it creates a lot of challenges for us in our business for yield estimation, predicting fruit quality, uh, predicting size profiles, harvest management and harvesting at the optimal maturity to uh, reach that consistency that our customers expect. Next. And, you know, as Enza and TNG, both here in New Zealand, what we perform is a quality risk assessment on all our blocks where we go in and we measure different attributes of the blocks in order to better understand uh, what our fruit risk level is for disorder and find or just decide what to do with the fruit, how to store it, where to sell it, um, how to treat it post-harvest. Um, some of the attributes that we, we measure are fruit counts. Um, uh, we look at vigor, crop load uniformity, amongst other cosmetic uh, issues or defects, along with fruit size. But the way we do this is going into a block, depending on the size of it, we go into different areas and we take samples, we aggregate the data and we average it out and we get a risk assessment profile that you see here. This is what we enter in our harvest engine platform. And we give this, we give this data to all of our growers. They all have a unique login and are able to see their risk level based on our current methods of doing the risk assessment. Along with that, our estimations that we're doing, you know, traditionally, in a traditional way from bloom, summer, and, uh, and our final estimates. We also, uh, as you see there on the bottom, it says risk assessment, that's based on the number of our fruit counts. So this is what we provide to the growers. Next. With the Green Atlas Cartographer, it gives us a completely different picture. Um, here, we're, we're able to scan an entire block. And again, you know, we're in the infancy of looking into this technology, but I think we value a lot of the potential use and uh, data that we were able to pull from this. First of all, like I said, instead of sampling in, in different areas in the block, um, we're able to scan an entire block with high resolution get fruit counts to measure uh, our crop uniformity. For example, on this image here that you see, the yellow area is very low crop load. And for our varieties, we know that that's gonna pose a certain set of challenges post-harvest. Um, the dark blue area um, is very heavy um, and that's gonna uh, pose a, a different set of challenges as well. But if we're taking samples in random areas, we really don't understand um, what our block's really telling us and, and, and what we need to do to increase that uniformity. So with our scans this last year, we collected fruit counts. Um, we feel like, um, and this is part of the validation process, uh, canopy density and tree height could be translated as vigor. Block uniformity, we can use fruit counts to see the uniformity of our crop load. Um, we, we are able to capture fruit size, color hue, depending on when you scan. And that's also very valuable because you could potentially um, have a strong estimate on what the grade distribution could be for your fruit. And then probably the most important thing is year over year tracking, you know, depending on the timing and how many times you scan your uh, orchard blocks. Let's say if you go early in the season, you're able to take corrective measures earlier in the season and set your crop load right before green fruit thinning. Um, come back, you know, and uh, right before harvest and get the data that um, our sales and marketing teams and packers need and, and for our estimates. So that's pretty exciting for us. Next, you know, some additional applications um, that we look forward to using in the future. And some of these blocks that we're using the cartographer in is canopy management. So for example, in the areas that were yellow last year at harvest and had a light crop load, um, history and uh, will tell us that those are gonna bloom very heavily this year. So we may take a different approach in pruning that area versus the dark blue um, or the heavier areas, we, we may not be as aggressive that can translate into our nutrition program as well, knowing where we may need a little extra help to carry a heavier crop and where we should probably back off potentially. 
on the nutrition or on nitrogen, um, along with crop load management strategy, um, scanning earlier on, being able to thin um, some of the areas that are heavier and maybe hang a couple doubles in the areas that are a bit lighter. Uh, potentially some irrigation modification on timing and application um, may be required to get our blocks a bit more uniform. And um, I guess another very exciting part of this data is um, the, the data we can collect for our packers, um, you know, industry-wide, and it's changing with new technologies, but industry-wide, once you pick the fruit, you take a small sample and you create a size profile and a grade distribution from 50 apples off the truck. And, you know, it's, it's not enough. And this may give us the opportunity to paint a better picture for our packing teams uh, to make a, a production runs a lot more efficient and, and they can prepare for what the fruit quality could look like. And ultimately marketing and sales, they're always wanting to know what's coming so they can create their sales programs with the big retailers. So this may give us some more accurate data going forward. So yeah, thank you. Awesome, Danny, and thanks for sticking around to take questions and answers um, and discussion at the end. Really great insights and it's, uh, it's great to work with you. Um, all right, so the land down under, down there in New Zealand, Mike, Jack, and Alex, the floor is yours, gentlemen. Thanks for joining today. Right, thanks, Steve. Yeah, just a brief introduction then on fruition, where we're be our twentieth year in business coming up this year. We've kind of evolved from being an advisory consultancy company into uh, technical services and increasingly precision hort. Which, uh, if you look at the bottom bar in that slide there, uh, you'll see we've put uh, homology or agronomy, if you like. Uh, front and center with precision hort, and and increasingly uh, we see that that's what our our clients uh, are interested in, and and where we're going with the business. So we're a small company, small private company. Uh, there's three separate fruition businesses: one in to the north in Kiwi Fruit Country, and one in the South Island in Hawke's Bay. We're just eight permanent staff and a and a dozen uh, seasonal staff. So you can see the uh, the website there if you want to learn a bit more, you can go there. Next slide. So I'm feeling I'm feeling a bit guilty here, but I didn't realize, Steve, this is such a high power presentation. And uh, so there's a couple of kind of rough and ready slides here. And, it, and I'm also conscious that you know this is very much a work in progress, and, and some of this is maybe not completely up to date. Um, but we're very focused on, on the value proposition for growers and working with our Green Atlas partners where we're constantly, uh, I guess, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a sort of a tension between how can we develop the tech uh, and, and what are growers wanting? And, and that's um, a constant process. And Steve and James are used to us having lots of pesky questions and, and lots of demands about could we do this and could we add that and the, the building of models is, is an ongoing process and, and really exciting and uh, yeah we, we've come an awfully long way in a short time and, and we're really lucky to have such a great uh, working partnership with our Aussie mates. Uh, so this is a kind of a brief um, snip I guess of, of the process and, and Danny's actually done a fantastic job of describing it and uh, and and really a lot of this might echo what what he's already said. So if we just step through the, the different uh, growth stages, um, growers are actually becoming quite interested in this whole area of um, how much canopy do they have, especially for young blocks and especially for new uh, growing systems with planar canopies. And so wire fill uh, is important and, and buds, and Mike's going to speak to that. So that can tell us a, a lot about how well a, a block has been pruned, uniformity, 
uh, and the potential of a block. And and because labor is such a, a big issue these days, the availability and the cost of it, being able to check how well jobs are being done is, is, is quite important and uh, increasingly a justification for, for the, the tech. Uh, counting missing trees, that's kind of just an, something extra that can be done with a, a winter scan. When we first started, we thought that bloom density was going to be a big deal, but it's still kind of sitting there a little bit on the side. Um, we thought that variable rate chemical thinning, uh, using a bloom density map to uh, create a prescription map for fruitlet thinning programs, we're getting there slowly, but it hasn't taken off to the degree that we thought it would. As Danny mentioned, uh, and for a variety like jazz, which is prone, uh, prone to pit and blotch, uh, the, the uniformity of bloom is a good indicator of, of storage risk for blocks. And, and we're, uh, as Danny has said, and we're working with TNG here to look at replacing the very subjective uh, assessments of, of uniformity and vigor in blocks to using the cartographer to do that uh, objectively. Uh, so that's a work in progress. Um, coming now to fruitlet uh, stage and, and post chemical thinning and beforehand thinning, it's a, uh, this is where we're getting into the more business as usual um, uh, deployment of, of green atlas and orchards here. Um, so looking at after chemical thinning, what does your crop look like uh, and, and what are your priorities for thinning and often we see that there's things like edge effects of uh, higher fruit set adjacent to pollinizers uh, or other things that can inform the approach taken in, in uh, thinning a block and being care, careful where you have uh, less fruit to play with. Uh, and, and even to the point of not putting staff uh, into areas that are very close to target. The fruit clustering is, is a new measure that um, Green Atlas have come up with, and it's really our first sort of year of using this. Uh, and Mike's going to speak uh, to, to some of the early work we've done uh, to assess the efficacy of chemical thinning programs, um, which is kind of using. Green Atlas has a, a research tool at large scale uh, in commercial orchards. Uh, and and uh, we're, we're already seeing a, quite a bit of enthusiasm with that. And, it, and it's a great, a great tool for that. Uh, fruit size also is, is, I guess, fully validated now. I think I'm allowed to say that, am I, Steve? Um, so, so again, uh, it's an early read on on uh, size and, and whether we want to push or restrict size and managing orchard inputs um, through the season. And finally, it's sort of a crop estimation phase. Uh, and this is where and Danny explained that well, um, knowing what, what the crop is coming in, uh, so we can measure fruit size uh, and how we're doing against, um, against target. There's also a chance to QC the thinning job immediately after hand thinning. But I guess sadly the environment we're in in New Zealand is with labor so short, we're almost lucky to get the job done uh, uh, rather than saying, oh gee, then those rows were missed and those rows haven't quite been done. And this, uh, there's a case and a value proposition to go back and tidy up a block. And that's what, you know, if label was more available, that's that's the sort of thing we'd like to do. Uh, and I guess what isn't shown here is integrating measures of uh, fruit with canopy, so fruit fruit counts against leaf area. And and I think this is probably the hottest item in terms of the the roadmap of where we'd like to go. Um, and, and that's probably. Uh, Maybe a discussion for another day. So next slide. So the, the previous slide, I guess, was what the cameras are, are seeing, and, and and this is really what the lidar uh, data is is 
giving us uh, in terms of uh, canopy management, um, in, in terms of uh, canopy geometry, and, and, and spray calibration, again, it's probably a subject for another day, but uh, there's quite a, there's a big project getting underway in New Zealand here uh, around spray calibration. And, and as we've moved to uh, well, play in our canopies, we haven't really changed our whole approach and thinking to spray calibration. So we're currently sort of area basis, area based, it is a hectare or gallons per acre, I guess, but we want to move that to, to be canopy based calibration. So this year we're, we're correlating uh, leaf area uh, to the more traditional um, tree row volume assessments of canopy. And, and that's going to be, um, uh, I think, an important area in the future. There's also quite a bit of debate about whether uh, spray tech should move to real time sensing uh, or, or, or base it around prescription maps that are loaded in from previous measures. And I guess that's a debate, a work in progress, but there's a lot to be said for the prescription map approach uh, with. Um, it's less expensive and more reliable equipment uh, for deploying that. Um, and so, sorry, just reading the question there. Yeah, so so pr probably enough on that. Um, a couple of other models that have been developed, European canker, uh, probably more a wet weather disease situation, less of interest in Washington. If there is time, it'd be great to talk about uh, fire blight models because I'm sure that's something we share in uh, common. We'd like to uh, head down that path and haven't yet. And we have a, a mod, uh, maybe a New Zealand specific pest, but market access related apple leaf curling moods. Uh, we're developing and improving a model for that, which is sort of in that risk assessment market access space. So, so I hope that wasn't too long winded of an introduction. Um, and I think. Mike, we're over to you. Next slide. Thanks, Jack. Um, yeah, so rather than there in general, we would, we're just going to focus on, I guess, uh, three three areas that we, um, we've we been work, working on recently. And so I'll just cover the first two, and then uh, Alex is going to um, uh, finish it off with um, talking about root print. So uh, if we can just go to the next slide, and I'll introduce the dormant bud model. So. Um, what we have done last year is developed what I would just call maybe a early version of a uh, spur terminal bud model, uh, where we can express the number of uh, buds on a tree basis or on a row meter if it's a if it's a planar system. And I guess first, why did we do that? And um, so there is quite a move, as Jack alluded to uh, uh, previously, that in New Zealand. Uh, that at that time after after you've completed a prune, it is an opportunity to do, I guess, your first estimate of what your crop potential is, and then you make some assumptions about how how many of your buds are going to be floral and, and how many uh, apples you're going to carry on each of those buds. Um, we also see it, I mean, it can be done or completed before pruning, but often uh, it would be seen as a uh, quality check of the pruning that you've uh, completed in blocks and uh, and given our labour requirement, you may have a bit more of an opportunity in New Zealand to tidy up any blocks that um, haven't kind of met uh, specs. And also it gives you an opportunity to start thinking about your thinning strategies uh, by knowing what your early uh, crop potential is there. So that was the kind of why we went down this route to develop it. And um, if we go to the next slide, I'll just give you the early results out of that. Okay, so um, what we did with the model is in, in the start, we uh, we just restricted ourselves to two, two varieties here. So jazz, which um, Danny's obviously close to his heart. So um, uh, that was good. And uh, also galaxy, which is a, a gala. Here. And so the first graph that you can see at the top of the screen there is, is what you're looking at uh, manual counts on the x axis. So they're manual counts of spurs and terminal buds on apple trees. 
versus what the cartographer sees as far as detections. And so what we're looking for is a, a relationship between those counts and, and what the um, Green Atlas sees. And we were very um, uh, enthusiastic when we saw this relationship, because as you can see, it's fairly linear and it's, um, it's reasonably strong for a, for a first cut model. So, uh, so from there, then we included another couple of um, varieties, so Rocket and Dazzle, because we want, also wanted to make sure that we weren't developing a model that was just one variety specific. We wanted to have a range. And so that is the lower graph. Again, it's, um, I think you probably could see the x-axis again, but the x-axis is field count. So it's the manual counts of buds. Uh, and also the detections uh, from Green Atlas. And here you can see on the version two model, which we would hope is that we've, uh, we've strengthened the model. Uh, and also, again, we've got a very good linear relationship uh, between our manual counts and what the cartographer is seeing. And so then we have a model that we can now complete block scans of. And so rather than just a per tree basis, we can actually look at the variation uh, uh, across the block. Uh, we're still working on this model. Um, we don't know how many versions we'll have to go to before we're, we're satisfied. Probably, probably never. Um, but uh, so we are including uh, additional training data. So I have another round to send off to Australia at some stage, Steve. So um, we can look forward to that. Uh, and 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 it's really also trying to improve the robustness of the model over conditions. So you know, different light conditions. Are we consistently picking up? Uh, what we want to what we want to pick up. And so there's an example of one where uh, we we completed pretty early in the morning, and so the light conditions uh, were darker, but obviously we still have the um, strobe lights to help us as well. Uh, but we're including those sorts of images in the next edition of this, of this model. So I won't say it's the finished uh, case, but we're certainly happy with where it started. And um, if we go to the next slide, I'll give you the the result. So. Uh, very much like Danny alluded to, you can take a tree when you're sampling trees within a block, it can be misleading. And so here's an example in the uh, table there. Uh, the first, uh, there, are two, there are two blocks. So A1 is the uh, same variety, but A1 is one block on this particular orchard and A3 is another block on this particular orchard, all planted at the same time, same rootstock. But of course, there are variations block to block and between blocks. And so what, what you see in the first column is the counts that were manually counted. So uh, there were some manual counts completed across this orchard as they would normally do to, um, to get a, an idea of what buds they've got. And you can see in A1, we've got about 171 buds per tree. In A3, based on manual count, we've got about 106 buds per tree. If we go to where the green atlas bud counts, uh, so, um, and this is the average across the whole, uh, across all those rows. Uh, you can see that the count on A1 is 130. And so there is quite a discrepancy between the manual counts and the green atlas counts. We we're very happy with the calibration in that case. So we would say this, and that the, uh, that is a result that the manual counts would, um, did not get some representative of trees in that block. Hence, if you went off that assumption, you could 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 go a wee bit awry. Uh, and as we also see, sometimes the manual counts align perfectly with the cartographer, and so they pick the right trees. That they managed to be able to pick a typical tree. But um, uh, as we all know, that's reasonably difficult. Now uh, the report. So we do re we we are looking to report the bud model as a standardised format. Uh, we can also give it, uh, obviously, as a CSV into, uh, into our client's database so that they can manipulate it as well. Uh, and I just uh, this example, I don't know if, if it stands out, but uh, what you're actually looking at is the density of buds uh, through a block. And this one particularly took my fancy because if you can see, there's a theme there where about every fourth row is a little bit heavier in buds. And it's, uh, as I said, a pruning QC. I think that uh, the pruner that was working on that row was consistently uh, different, uh, working to different instructions than the other pruners that were working there. So that was kind of a nice uh, use case uh, first up for the bud model. Um, so the other part to this, we, so we're intending to launch this bud model 
uh, coming up now winter. So that'll be uh, the 23, 24 season. Uh, and we've also managed to uh, complete a comparison between the LIDAR and for, um, for our horizontal or 2D uh, planar growing systems where we can also get a measurement of wire fill because not only do you want to know how many buds you've got within your orchard but, uh, or within your block, but you also want to know uh, how many, uh, what is actually the occupancy of the wood within, within there to get your um, potential uh, yield, et cetera. So that's uh, uh, pretty much where we are with the bud model. Um, and I think we'll just move to the next slide and I'll cover the next one and we can go back if anyone's got any questions. So as Jack uh, mentioned, uh, what we've also been doing is using the Green Atlas tool with Pacifics to do uh, chemical thinning trials in apples. Now, this is nothing new. Uh, in my research career, I've done a number of chemical thinning trials over the years, but I guess what, and, and all our uh, clients are always assessing their chemical thinning regimes to work out uh, and assessing new chemistry and new approaches to try to optimize their thinning across, uh, across their orchards. Uh, and I guess that the value of doing it with the green atlas is that it can provide objective measurements of chemical thinning results. So rather than uh, being restricted to two or three tree plots to, 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 to gauge the effectiveness, this allows us to do comparisons at scale and on commercial orchards. Uh, and also, as Jack alluded to, we're all starting to look at not just total fruit numbers, but also the effect of some of these chemical thinners on clusters. So are they more effective at wiping out sites or are they actually working, uh, eliminating fruit within sites? So in one, I'm just going to show you one uh, for one customer. They had a number of comparisons that they wanted to evaluate. And I'm just going to give you a snapshot of that on the next slide. So, so here we have a table, uh, P2 and P3 are two blocks on a particular orchard. Uh, and thankfully, uh, in this instance, we have a control in each of those blocks, which is chemically unthinned. So it's uh, pretty much uh, as is. And then we have two chemical uh, thinning treatments, uh, a BA and an NAA or an oxen uh, treatment versus meteor. And that was the question that they wanted to know. They wanted to know which one was a more effective uh, chemical thinner in this case. Um, as Jack alluded to, not only do we have fruit number, but we also have a measurement of what the leaf area is. So here we have average cross-sectional leaf area. And if you like, I guess it's a proxy for the tree size. And so obviously a bigger tree can carry more numbers of fruit. So if you just concentrate on numbers of fruit uh, in itself, that can um, lead you down a wee bit of a, uh, a false alley. Um, they also had targets for fruit numbers in this block. Uh, they were reasonably high, uh, and I'll, I'll cover that, I guess, in the in the, uh, conclusions. And so if we're looking at, we can analyze the fruit numbers per tree between the controls and the treatments. And we can also look at the average number of fruit per cluster, and also the number of clusters. And uh, obviously we can graph that as well. And so there are, uh, on the graph on the right-hand side is basically a, a box plot showing those results and uh, also showing the spread that we saw uh, through those through those blocks as well. But uh, what kind of information do you get out of this? Well, in this particular orchard, uh, we can conclude that Meteor, which is a fruit that's only used here in New Zealand, or Metamitron, might be the brand name that you, you're more familiar with, um, it was more effective at moving, removing fruitlets uh, overall and also within cluster. Uh, even when we take in some uh, account of tree size. And the other uh, point here, which uh, is that the targets in this case were actually based on trunk cross-sectional area. And uh, through this trial, we identified that actually for this particular growing system, which is a 2D growing system, where there's quite a bit of uh, pruning to keep it into that planar uh, system, that perhaps trunk cross-sectional area was not appropriate for them to set their targets. And so it quickly identified that there may be some better me measures or metrics that we can use in the future to um, set the crop targets for, um, for these blocks. And I think I'm just gonna finish there, Alex, and uh, 
at least give you some time to. Uh, you normally steal all of Alex's time, so I'm, I'm being good to that. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So I was just going to take us through um, a particular use case that um, we've deployed on Orchard um, based on some of the information we've been able to get from the Green Atlas cartographer for one of our clients. So um, our objective was to um, base a selective route crew um, on some canopy density information that we got from the Green Atlas cartographer. Um, the block in question that we were doing it on had some uh, relatively significant variation in tree size and vigour, um, largely soil induced. Um, so the goal there was to try and improve uniformity by slowing down some of the more vigorous areas um, as a root prune does, um, but without affecting the smaller and uh, kind of struggling areas. And then um, in improving the uniformity, we're also hoping that we'll optimise the yield outcomes of that block in the process. Um, so if we get on to the next slide. Um, so yeah, this is pretty basic, but um, it's uh, on the right there is the map that we uh, deployed in the spring of 2021. Um, so in this instance, the root pruner had to be operated manually. Um, so that meant that the driver in the cab of the tractor was um, inserting or removing the knife from the ground based on that map, which they had displayed to them um, as a geo PDF. So they could see their location in relation to that map. Um, and as they entered and exited the zones, they followed accordingly um, operating the night. So that was based around the canopy density of 45%, uh, which was kind of deemed to be the threshold uh, at the time of that block. Um, and so, yeah, greater than 45% density, those trees um, were root pruned. And um, under that density, those trees were left alone. Um, so yeah, if we get on to the next slide. So in the or at the conclusion of that season, um, after the growth had terminated, we uh, ran the cartographer through that block again. Um, so on the left, we've got the before scan. So the left-hand side is what that prescription map was based on. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we've got what we saw in the follow-up after growth had terminated that season. So overall, we saw a 10% uh, increase in canopy density on average at that block, um, which I guess we weren't really hoping to see, but at the same time, the trees are still actively growing. Um, they get to reach full size. Um, and we also questioned whether the root prune only on one side of the tree um, was intense enough to actually knock the vigor out of those more vigorous areas of the block. Uh, so if we flip on to the next slide, so to analyze that a little bit um, from that first season, we subtracted the before scan from the after scan data and threw an adjustment of 10% to uh, roughly account for the fact that the whole block had gotten a bit denser on average. So what was pleasing to see from that was what's shown in the light blue color on the bottom left there is those areas uh, in the light blue year, they increased in canopy density at a rate greater than average, we could say. Um, and we were quite pleased to see that those areas, particularly in that northern subsection, aligned with where the root prune or the areas that hadn't been root pruned, sorry. So we took that as essentially the areas that didn't get root pruned were given the chance to catch up a little bit more and expand a bit quicker than the remainder of the block. Um, so that was a kind of a surface level um, assessment of of what we'd achieved with that root prune. Um, so if we head on to the next slide. Um, so in terms of uniformity, we wanted to look into that as well. So what we saw with that canopy growing overall um, was not too much of an improvement in uniformity uh, using canopy density as a measure, um, but another measure of canopy that we get from the Green Atlas cartographer is uh, cross-sectional leaf area. Um, and we did see a bit more of a notable improvement in uniformity in that measurement. Um, so that gave us a bit of, uh, uh, you know, a bit more of an indication that we might have achieved some, some sort of success there. Um, but overall, there were some questions around the intensity of the root prunes, so that one side of the tree only, um, and just how accurately the operator was able to follow that prescription map um, due to its manual nature and, and having to read that map as he was going along. Uh, so we didn't uh, pursue any further analysis uh, based on that initial season. But if we flip to the next slide, um, so here we are, Q2 
climbing into Spring 22 or Spring 22 that's been. So we uh, made a few changes to the way that we approached it. So this time the application of the prescription map was able to be fully automated using a smart controller. Um, so that basically removed any responsibility on the operator of following that map. Uh, we got a lot greater confidence that the knife was in the ground where it should have been and was out of the ground where it, uh, where it needed to be. Um, and we also looked at varying levels of intensity as well. So uh, hitting those more vigorous areas but harder um, with, the, with the two side prune. Um, and due to the nature of the root pruner with the single blade on one side meant that that had to be applied in two separate passes. So the first pass attacking one side of the tree um, and then switching over to the second prescription map, which is the one shown on the bottom there, um, and coming at the rows from the different direction to give the second side of the tree in those vigorous areas um, another prune. So we're hoping that um, with running the cartographer through that block again very soon, now the growth is terminated, um, we'll be able to do a bit of a deeper analysis on that and hopefully see some, some meaningful improvements to uniformity have been achieved. So, yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Um, great overview. So um, we caught some of the Q&A live. Steve had answered one of the questions I had as well, uh, but it looks like we have a couple of open ones to answer live. And um, so for the fruition, gents, uh, when root pruning, how did you, or did you include soil parameters and data? I know you, go ahead. No, we didn't. Our prescription map was solely based on on the canopy geometry. The, and from soil maps, we can see, uh, as Alex touched on, that that uh, they're very much related to each other. But but we went directly off off the uh, the canopy lidar data. Got it. Um, thank you, Herman, on that question, Garrett. Uh, Bishop has a question on the chem thinning trial. Were all of the treatments within the same block? Uh, simple answer is no. So um, yeah, these are, I guess, grower trials. So they're not necessarily the fully replicated experimental trials that we might like to see. Uh, but uh, saying that, uh, it is an orchard that they deem to be reasonably uniform. So they would approach it with one kind of chemical thinning approach. And so the two blocks in that example I gave you were deemed to be comparable, although from the green atlas we can, we can um, establish some of the wee subtle differences between those blocks. Or is this a this is a language question? Is it? But do you mean so we would say uh, well, is it orchard or block? Uh, same orchard, yes. Uh, but within the within that orchard that had many blocks in it, uh, they, they were separate blocks, but same age, same root stock. And spatially beside each other as well. So in a similar okay. area of the orchard. Yeah, that's great clarity. Okay. Any other questions? We've covered a lot of ground, pun intended. Um, Mr. Chipman, the pear guy. Are you currently working with any automated tractor companies to automate these decisions like fertilizing? Um I'll have a go at that, and then Steve, feel free to compliment. Or, or why don't you start, Steve? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, the short answer to the question is we're not working with tractor companies directly, um, but we've established relationships with quite a few uh, third-party automated controller manufacturers. And those controllers, like the one that the New Zealand used for root pruning, are, are typically multi-functional. So the same controller can be bolted onto a, a blast sprayer, can be bolted onto the root pruner, or it can be put onto um, you know, something like a, a, a dry spreader. Um, and so, yeah, we've established a couple of those relationships, uh, four or five companies that, that do that. Uh, our software exports prescription maps directly um, to, to those, uh, those pieces of equipment. And the reason we've done that is we think, and this is really just a philosophical view, but uh, you know, we think that the market for retrofit of a uh, controller 
onto an existing piece of high value equipment is probably a much bigger market than you know the automated piece of equipment that you've got to buy brand new at at top dollar so that that's coming down the pipe but we see that as being you know the market that will come next whereas the retrofit onto existing equipment we think is the market that's coming now yeah and to add on to that as well um the focus in smart orchard projects this year as much as possible will be to integrate in with uh folk so on the fertilizer front nutrien has stepped up um and will be providing uh based on some soil mapping data that we have and in coll collaboration with bernadita salato um at wsu extension um some applications variable wrap rate applications on the fertilizer side of things on the spray side uh we're actively working with um with uh, uh smart apply um and then from a dealership perspective working with burrow tractor um, on connecting the dots there um as well as any others that uh, are are open to collaborating on that so um and hopefully if anybody out here is going to be at world ag expo um down in Tulare next week i would love to meet up with you down there um we'll be meeting with a number of folks down there that kind of tie into this world over time blue white robotics uh etc as well so uh, great question randall um aaron magenheim um and we're just about needing to wrap here but how do we tie this to actual profit improvements who's usually signing off a pilot or more um Great couple of questions. Um, Mike and team, do you want to talk to, because you spoke toward yield improvement as an example. Yeah, who we're talking to, it really depends on the size of the company. It tends to be the, the, the technical managers uh, and ops. Um, in terms of profit assessment, yeah, we that is important. And we there is some software out there that can measure the the value uh, delivered by these um, treatments and we're doing that and and that's probably on uh, green atmosphere's to-do list as, as well uh we, if i understand aaron's question you know, we scanned four thousand acres roughly last year here in new zealand and and we hope that will it's clicked up a little bit this year and rod how are you mate good to see you on the call uh, what's, is there recognition between spurs and terminals? No, we're not distinguishing between the two. We we had a discussion internally whether we would go down that track and we decided that, you know, ostensibly spurs and terminals in New Zealand um, have very similar, similar characteristics. So they're, they're managed pretty similar. So that was why we decided to not split them up. Yeah, physiologically, we figured what a terminal spur on a longer shoot, so we could treat them the same. Well, I guess one of the issues is some varieties, one year old buds or auxiliary buds, can be fat enough to be detected because uh, it's really on their size and mass and shape, I guess. So, but then if they're that big and fat, they're probably likely to flower and maybe set too. But yeah, we can't distinguish anatomically. All right. I think that's a wrap. Um, we would all love to stay on here. I think another half hour plus having discussions around this because this is our this is where the fun is, right? And so really, really appreciate um Steve with Green Atlas, Danny with Enza, and uh Mike and the crew over there in fruition for coming together across several time zones answering these questions today and i would encourage you to reach out to us if you're in north america reach out to innovate ag um, if you are down in new zealand certainly reach out to the fruition folks um, and between us we can all uh, connect the dots um, on uh, basically you know empowering your growers you as growers with with data thanks for your time everybody and have a great evening